Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us for our Keys to Homeownership webinar. My name is Matt Dalton, and I am the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development at the Los Angeles Police Federal Credit Union. And if you're joining us this evening because you're interested in buying your first home or a move up home, or maybe even a vacation home or a home to retire in, then I'd like to let you know that you're in the right place. Um, and our goal this evening with this webinar is to give you an overview of the home buying process, just to make you aware of some of the things that you'll need to think about as you go through that process, some of your different options, some of the decisions that you'll need to make. And we hope by the end of the presentation that you'll be in a position where you can make some better informed decisions about these things. Um, especially since this is probably one of the largest, if not the largest financial commitment that you'll ever make during your lifetime. So um, just a, a couple housekeeping items before we get started. Um, this is a live uh, webinar session. Um, however, we will be recording it and sending you the recording afterwards. So don't feel like you have to try to absorb everything uh, as we go. Uh, and you will be uh, muted. You'll be in listen only mode. Um, however, you can type questions into the Q&A box, which you should see on your screen now. And what we're going to do is reserve some time at the end of the session for our presenters to take your questions and respond to them. So please do type your questions into that box. We encourage you to do that. Thank you very much. And let's go to the next slide. Um, OK, so. Um, our presenters this evening, I'd like to introduce them to you. And first up, we have Brad Korb. Uh, he's the owner of the Brad Korb Real Estate Group, and Brad has been helping people in Los Angeles, buy and, hell, uh, buy and um, sell homes since 1979. So he has been doing this for a while now. And in 2020, Brad and his team helped nearly 200 clients um, with their home buying and selling needs. And Brad is currently ranked, and I didn't know this until uh, we were putting this presentation together, but Brad is currently ranked uh, the number four real estate agent in Los Angeles County by Zillow, which is very impressive. Congratulations to you, Brad, because we know how many agents there are in Los Angeles County. So that is impressive. Um, also joining us this evening is our very own Veronica Moskowitz. Hey, Veronica. Um, Veronica um, has been the mortgage operations manager here at LAPFCU for five years now. It's a, nice milestone. And prior to that, Veronica um, had extensive experience, in fact, over two decades of experience in the mortgage industry, working for some very large national uh, mortgage companies. And in, in her uh, role at those companies, she's basically helped thousands of people buy homes. So, um, as you can tell, we've lined up some very experienced speakers for you this evening, and um, I know that they're going to have a lot of good information and insight to share with you. Um, and I hope you welcome me in uh, you join me in welcoming them. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brad. Thanks. Matt, thank you very much. Look forward to having a great uh, webinar here with uh, Veronica, and thanks for the introduction, and Natalie, thanks for hosting it. I appreciate it very, very much. So tonight we'll talk about the agenda about real estate. So, so making the decision to buy is, is the right now the right time for you? And how do you go about selecting a real estate agent? We'll talk a little bit about the purchasing process of how we buy properties, and then how we find the right and amazing home for you. And also we'll talk a little bit about market trends and what's going on in today's real estate world. And then how we're dealing with the uh, pandemic considerations with uh, COVID going on right now still. And then of course, 
We'll talk about the financial options and how to get qualified to buy an amazing property for yourself and your family. First, we'll talk about, you know, making the decision to buy, you know, you're renting now, what's the benefits of renting um, and compared to the benefits of buying? You know, basically you have a, a steady income that's coming in that you're getting from your from your job and that you can use for making a down payment and purchasing a home. The, the interest rates are at super historic lows, which Veronica will talk about here in a, in a little bit, uh, but they're, they are incredible. Um, and the prices have been very reasonable. They've ticked up a little bit since last year where the interest rates before COVID were about a percent to a percent and a half higher. So now you actually have more buying power. When we're comparing the renting to buying, you know, renting, you can move it all the time. Usually you have a one year lease and then you're, you're, you're gone. So you can, you know, go and, <laughs> and move as often as you want all over, all over the place. Once you, you know, you purchase a home, it's a little bit harder just to, you know, say that's it, I'm moving and changing locations. It'll take a little while because of the purchase cost that you buy to purchase um, when you, you know, the, the cost for the loan and the, uh, the closing cost to the selling to, you know, to make those funds back because you have purchase costs and you have selling costs. So it takes a while if you want to decide to sell to have a, a break even. Um, there are no tax benefits. I think you get a renter's credit of like $70 or something like that from the federal government compared to when you buy a home. Um, you know, talk with your CPA, but I equate it like, you know, basically that, you know, you get some tax write-off for all the interest payments that you're making. It's almost like the government's making part of your house payment for you. Um, as I said, I can't give tax advice, but talk with your CPA because these interest write-offs go right against your income. So it's almost like Uncle Sam is paying part of your mortgage payment. Um, another benefit of renting, you have less responsibility. You know, if you have a little leaky toilet or you know, you've got a little uh, window that, you, you know, gets a, a little crack in it or something like that. You don't pick up the phone and call your landlord. You now have to, you know, fix your own windows or, you know, go down to Home Depot and get a wrench and take about take off a little trap on your pipe and replace it or call a plumber or something like that. So you have a little bit more responsibilities when you own a house compared to just renting away. Um, you know, the thing... Renting, it also talks about forced to re, uh, relocate. As time goes on, you know, the rents keep on going up and up and up. Um, when you're buying your own property, your equity goes up and up and up every single year. You're paying down your mortgage. And at some point in time, you know, they, they call it burn, burn the mortgage uh, <laughs> party that you can, you know, burn your mortgage and uh, you have no, you know, no house payments, you know, down the road in 15, 20 or 30 years and you'll just have your, you know, your payments that you have for your, your taxes and your insurance, which goes on forever. Um, when you're renting, you also have certain restrictions. They'll say you can have a dog, you can't have a dog, you can have a cat, you can't have a bird. So when you have your own property, you have the ownership. So, you know, you can, if you want to get some pets, you can get some pets. Uh, if you want to paint your walls, you know, yellow on the outside of <laughs> on your stucco, you can, you can do that. You could also Planned your vegetable gardens, um, you know, things like this you cannot do when you're, you know, renting a property. And this just talks about, you know, the steady income you need to have, you know, when you qualify for a loan, unless you're paying cash, you'll have to have some sort of cash um, flow from a job or from income properties. As I said, uh, Veronica can talk a little bit about more about that when she talks about the mortgage size. But you know they're looking for you know a regular paycheck that you're getting you know paychecks, um, your W you know W twos W nine depending on how you're getting paid. They want to see you know your cash reserves in the bank for a, a, a few months, and they want to see your season down payment too. So you have to show proof of funds and that you've got some sort of steady income coming in to qualify unless you're you know, paying cash for the property.
interest rates you talked about briefly before, but you know the great thing is number one, if you're if you're instead of buying a house that's say seven hundred thousand or eight hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, whatever the number is, your payment has gone down a whole bunch from last year, like last February um, BC before COVID. It's now incredibly low. Um, another flip to it, instead of being able to afford five hundred thousand last February, you make it afford now. You know, maybe 600, 625, you know, depending on, you know, what the interest rate is. It went up, it had a couple of bumps last month in February, but then it's, it's um, trailed down a little bit in March so far. So uh, lower payment or more buying power, you, you know, your choice. As I said, Veronica can talk to you a little bit about that when, when she get when her turn comes up next. How much can you afford? You should be able to afford two and a half times your annual salary. Market uh, the mortgage calculators can help you determine your income, debt, and debt to income ratio. Um, I think on the website there's a calculator program that Veronica can, can uh, point you to, um, and of course the credit union Veronica and her team are there to help help you with anything you need in the way of getting qualified. We're we're here to help you feel very comfortable in the home buying process. Finding the home, you know, people have different, you know, different kinds of wants and needs. Some people will say, I want to be out a little bit further out in Santa Clarita, I want a little bit more space at a more reasonable price. Some people will say, well, I want to live in the valley and I, I'd like to have a little con condo. I want to be able to walk to the boulevard down to Sherman Oaks and Ventura Boulevard. Some people may say, I'd like to have a house out in Lakeview Terrace or Silmar. The little horse properties where you get a reasonable price home and also have a little bit more land. So, you know, you just have to, you know, put down your wants and needs. What kind of lifestyle are you looking for? I call it the Ben Franklin clothes, the benefits of, you know, um, having someplace local closer in, or would you like something a little bit more further out and more land, depending on what you're looking for? Make a list of the features that, you know, important to you. You know, do you want to be close in? Would you rather, as I said, have more land? You don't mind commuting as much. So, you know, what's important to you? We also suggest that you drive around the neighborhood. You can drive around the neighborhood in the mornings, the nights, the weekends, so you get a feel of, you know, what's going on in the, on the neighborhood. And then also you can search for homes online in certain neighborhoods, and that way you can find out, you know, what the price points are in those neighborhoods so we can do some comparison shopping online. Making it, make it an offer. When you find your dream home, you're, you're, ask your agent to provide you with comparables. Comps, as they call it, is doing a comparative market analysis. So you can get comps. Um, if you were buying a home in a subdivision, you can find out you know, what are the comps in the subdivision? I usually you know, tell clients, you know, we like to go back six months to track what the history is, what's going on in the subdivision. Um, the condominium, if you're looking at condominium, you can actually track that building and see if there's been any sales. Sometimes you'll have to go back a couple of years to find um, um, sales in that exact complex. If it's a condominium, you may go out a little bit further um, they'll usually run comps within a one mile radius within the last six months. If it's a two bedroom, they want to pull a two bedroom um, and they'll find similar type properties and ages. Um, like as I said, if we're looking at something north of Ventura Boulevard, we wouldn't comp it to something south of Ventura Boulevard. Some of the homes aren't really trackish. Um, like if you're buying a house, let's just say out in Granada Hills, some of them are um, not really tracks. I mean, they've been there since the 50s and 60s. So they usually will pull like a range of maybe like a half mile to a mile. They'll go within the last six months and they'll pull 75 to 20, uh, 75 to 125% of the square footage to give you an idea what's going on in the neighborhood. The only thing I will say is the, the comps that we are selling today are seems like at, at, at the market now with the super uh, low inventory and super low interest rates. Some of the th properties that we're selling now are creating the new comps which means it may be a little bit higher than the last comp in there um, because you know the prices have, have gone up. 
Last year, the, the house went up approximately 15%. So we figure the house will have some appreciation this year. We don't think it's gonna be quite as much with the interest rates going up a little bit. Um, they're, they're slowing down the, um, you know, they're trying to slow down the appreciation. You know, you need to get pre-approved before you go shopping. If you find your dream home, you don't want to be scrambling and trying to reach Veronica and her team to get a pre-approval. And it'll take you three, four, five days to get all your paperwork together. And by that time, your dream home should could be gone. So get all your paperwork together, get in, get your pre-approval so that when you you're looking at properties, you are ready to go. Um, basically, when we're talking about making an offer too, ho too low, which is too high, um, that's a conversation you can have with your with your agent. You know, if you're saying, well, I want to, my, my dad tells me write 10% off anything that's on the market, um, you might not even get a counter because in this high moving market, you know, things are selling a little bit below list, at list, and sometimes above list. So it's important to have a conversation with your real estate agent. Um, you know, on this specific type of property, what's going on with it. Also, he, that agent can reach out to the listing agent and try to get some um, some information from what kind of, do they have any offers? Does it look like it's going above list price? So I always encourage, you know, the team members here to reach out to the other agent and see what's going on and get a feel of what the agents are looking for in the way of offers. Um, and it just, you know, with, with the market the way it is, you may have to make offers on multiple properties before you get one. I just tell clients, hopefully you'll get the house that you want, but they, you may not get your, your first house, your dream house, as you put it. You might have to make offers on three, four, five properties. Um, some, of the, some of the competition now, they're getting funds from like mom, dad, uncle, sister, so that virtually they can pay cash for it. Not that they're paying cash and paying cash forever, but they're paying cash to make their offer stronger that they can take away the loan contingency and appraisal contingency. Um, and sometimes they're even taking out the physical inspections which I don't recommend. Um, we always wanna know what's going on with the property. And we, you know, for your protection, you should have some sort of clause in there for appraisal and for the loan approval. You know, you need to ask yourself the kind of following questions. How much do you love the house? And then, you know, how much can you afford Sometimes clients get um, you know, a little carried away when they get into bid wars. We want you to feel 100% comfortable that the price you're gonna pay for the home, that you're comfortable with the monthly payments um, and going forward for the next you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, or what, however long you anticipate being in the property. Um, and of course, your agent can help you, you know, decide you know, about what's you know, right for you, offer-wise, you know, the, you're confident to help you get the home at the best price and the best terms. But in the reality of today's market, it is very competitive out there. I've been selling properties recently, sometimes three offers, four offers, sometimes 23 offers. Um, for the desirable properties, there's just not a lot of inventory out there. The purchase pro process. You finally get your house accepted and you go to escrow, yay! <laughs> I'm happy, Veronica is happy. So now, now comes the fun part. Within three business days, you need to get your deposit wired into escrow. So that'll be your, you know, the 3% deposit. Usually that's what's standard in today's offer. Sometimes if you're, you know, if you're willing to and your agent suggests it, you can even make a larger deposits to, you know, become stronger in the very beginning with multiple bids. I've had the agents here sometimes, you know, if there's something, let's say 500,000, they might do a $50,000 deposit or something like that. It's all, you know, refundable subject to your physical inspection and all those things, but you can make your deposit stronger if you'd like to. Once your offer is accepted, it's usually they open escrow within one to two business days. They will send you escrow instructions Escrow is a third neutral party. They basically take instructions from the buyer and the seller. So it's basically a place where um, the escrow will coordinate the closing with all the parties. They collect paperwork. They get the title reported in the property, make sure the property is clear of all encumbrances. They'll send you out the title. It's called the prelim title report. It'll show you about the, the lot lines, you know, from the, from the tax assessor's maps. It'll show you what encumbrances are on it. 
We want to make sure everything's cleared. The only thing that will be on there will be the taxes, which go on forever. And then if the seller had a mortgage on the property, it will basically um, be you know, paid off. And then your, your loan will get put in the first position. Um, the, the sellers will also put in any other documents that will help, you know, that will be necessary to close the property. You'll put in all your, um, you know, all your funds, your deposit, and then two days prior to close of escrow, you'll put in the rest of the funds. Um, all the loan docs will be signed. It'll go through the escrow back to the lender so the lender can fund the loan and then close it. Um, and then you also your insurance, which Matt, I think we'll talk about a little bit at the end because they have insurance that's also associated with the, uh, um, the police department, federal credit union, that they can also help you with your insurance needs. The purchase process. Basically, you know, you'll complete all the paperwork, the escrow paper we talked about briefly. Um, you'll get an estimated closing statement from Veronica. She'll tell you exactly what, you know, here's what the escrow fees are, this is what the loan fees are, and she'll get, get you the estimated closing cost. We'll get a copy of the appraisal and you will get that from Veronica. The inspection you usually do with your agent, that's during the time of the escrow. Um, typical, the time frame in the contract is 17 days. Most of the buyer's agents are cutting that down to seven to compete with multiple bids. Talk with your agent, you know, find out, you know, are you having the house inspected with, do you have a home inspector that you're going to use, a friend of the family, are you going to go for a couple of the agent's recommendation? Um, you can find out how quickly can they get into the house and do the inspection. I've had inspection companies be able to go out in two to three days and get the reports to you immediately. Again, if you're in multiple bid situation, the quicker that you can remove these contingencies, the better off you'll be when you're in competition. Um, I spoke briefly before about insurance. You need insurance to insure the lender, um, has insurance in case you know the house burns down, the slip and falls on, you know, in your house, you know, typical things that you need to you know talk about. Um, and as I said, Matt will talk on that briefly. Um, the, as I said, you, they've got great insurance people that work with a credit union in-house that are, can take amazing care of you. Um, the documents we talked about briefly, they are created right before the close of escrow to sign the loan docs. Usually that happens, you know, anywhere from seven to five days, three days prior to close of escrow. The, the loan docs will be signed. You'll have a signature notarized, and then they go back to the lender and they get ready to fund the loan. And then, da, 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 close the escrow, you get keys and you get to move into your amazing home. Reasons for, you know, moving up, buying a second home. We've noticed a lot of people during the COVID, we've helped them sell their condos and buy homes. People have sell their homes and buy bigger homes because now they have home offices. We've had them where the husband and wife, both are working out of the dining room at different ends of the dining room table, and that's now their home office. And after a while, they get, they've gotten a little bit tired of <laughs> watching each other in the dining room table and working as a home office. So um, a lot of people have been buying bigger homes. That, you know, um, A lot of the clients we've talked to now um, with the new COVID, their, their employers are saying, hey, you no longer have to come back to the office full time. We're going to do a hybrid work model where you may come into the office one day or two days a week and they're gonna let the employees work at home. So that's a brand new model that we've never had before. Some of the uh, big startups like Yelp, um, they've actually shut down their corporate head headquarters in uh, San Francisco and telling everyone to you know, work at home. So it's a, it's, a, it's a new world out there with people working virtually from their home. Um, buying a second home, I have a few rental properties. Um, the thing that I love about rental properties, I learned a long time ago, one of my friends told me it's called wake up money. You buy a rental property and eventually that's paid off and people hand you checks. So you don't have to go to work and they just basically hand you checks every month. And at first they pay down your mortgage and then once your mortgage is paid off, you have this great cash flow and you can use that as part of your retirement. You could use it for you know your kids' uh, you know education down the road. I use mine to um, help fund my kids' college and, it, and then basically my you know I still had the rental property when I was done paying for their. Um, the college. So that was a great thing. 
Um, and a lot of people now are just looking to buy second homes. They said, okay, well, I want to get away because they're working at their house. Um, you know, so now they're saying, hey, you know what? I don't want to be here on the weekend. Um, I'd like to have a little getaway. So we've seen a lot of clients, they're buying homes that down at the beaches, down out in the desert, up in Big Bear, Arrowhead, Ventura, Oxnard. So we're seeing a, a lot of secondary homes. Um, we've also seen some people buying secondary homes out of state, Utah, Idaho. So they're using it, you know, more as a once a, uh, you know, once a, you know, once a month and going there for a three or four day extended period. And they're saying, hey, at some point in time when I retire, this will be my home, and I'm going to buy it now. And they use it for vacation, but not quite as frequently. Retirement home. <laughs> Being near the kids and the grandkids. Um, we've seen quite a few times when, you know, you get your kids here and then they happen to be working for a company and they get relocated to Georgia. It's like, and then your grandkids are in Georgia. It's like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like, do I want to see my grandkids three or four times a year and travel or I'd rather be around and be part of the family and be able to go over there on nights and visit, go over there on the weekends, play with the grandkids and be more of a part, you know, help you know, help them, uh, you know, sometimes they've helped babysit, they've helped take the kids to school. So, you know, what part do you want to be when your kids, you know, decide to relocate and they move to Georgia or Texas or wherever they happen to go to? I'm also, you know, some of the times the clients have these ama amazing houses, but they've got homes that are, you know, 3,000, 4,000 square feet, four bedrooms, five bedrooms. And when they retire, they say, I don't need something that big. You know, I'm going to downsize. All I need is a two bedroom or a three bedroom. I don't, you know, I'm happy with an 1,800 square foot house, 1,500 square foot. I don't need to maintain this big house. I'm going to downsize and get something that, you know, this is all I need. Um, we're also seeing people that are going to what we call active communities. Um, there's a lot of them um, basically out in the desert, Palm Desert. I've got a friend of mine that lives in India. Um, they've got, you know, where they've got pools, they've got, you can go make jewelry, you can, you know, play pool, you can play bridge, you can play poker, you can do all kinds of things. They've got golf tournaments, putting green tournaments, all kinds of things. They like being involved in that. There's also one in Laguna Beach. Uh, my friends that have one in India, they also just bought their secondary place in Laguna. Um, they've got sailing classes over there. They've got all kinds of things. So, you know, they find that they want to be around people that are active and, and doing things um, that they their own, you know, their own likes and desires, shooting photography, all kinds of stuff. So there are a lot of active communities out there that you can, you know, move to and be real active and do things and be involved in, be involved in. Current market trends. What will this year's market look like and what will happen with the interest rates? Well, we think the market's going to, you know, and Veronica can talk about it a little bit also. We think that markets continue to go up. I don't think we're going to see the hyper, hyper price uh, appreciation like last year. Um, that was about 15% in our local market. We think it's going to be closer to somewhere under under 5%. Um, you know, they've already taken the interest rates up twice last month. Um, it was a half a point rise. Um, but I can talk a little, a little bit from but the information I got from um, the mortgage bankers. Um, information was basically that was a half point rise in February. It was the sixth time in the last two decades that it went up half a percent in one month. So six times in the last 20 years is not a lot. The government knows, you know, the people, from my understanding, the people that know, know they've got to take it up a little bit um, and cool off the market because if we just have, we're going to have hyperinflation in the real estate market. So we think the market's going to go up a little bit, but under I think in under five percent. We think the interest rates will creep up a little bit. I don't think they're going to go up horrifically. Um, Ron can talk about that a little bit, but they they need to you know slow down the appreciation. Um, they can't keep on having to go fifteen percent every single year. So I think they're going to work on balance that. Last year um, they were concerned because you know you know DC during COVID, you know. If they keep real estate economy going, it keeps a lot of other things going. Carpenters, gardener, painter, electrician, roofers, construction people. The real estate market drives a, a large percentage of the economy. So they keep real estate going, they keep a lot of the other um, components of the economy going. So that's the, 
go on. Pandemic consideration P forms, property entry advisory disclosures. So anytime you go into a house, you have to do a P form. So we just tell clients, you know, when you go in there, wear a mask. You're gonna when you go into a house, it's the agent and two buyers at the time. You can't have you, your husband, your daughter, your cousin all go tracing through the house at one time. By a lot at this point in time, it's the agent, two agents. Uh, two buyers at this time. Also, the open houses are not legal. We're telling people, you know, they do it with appointments with the agent. We wear the mask. Most of the time, the agents will have you take off your shoes or wear booties when you're walking through the property. Also, with the safe showings, you're not supposed to turn anything on. We're telling the sellers, turn on all the light switches, um, open the closet doors, don't in, open anything. Um, if you're going to open anything, ask for permission from your agent to ask the seller and always wear gloves when you're, um, you know, going to the property. And then the, and the gloves is, we just tell them use it from one house. When you go to the next house, put on a new set of gloves. There's a lot of talk about virtual touring or the agent walkthrough. We have done FaceTime with the buyer's agents um, and walk through the property with them sometimes the you know the first view the clients feel more comfortable doing the facetime and the walkthrough so agents will do that they'll do a facetime walkthrough with you or as what we just talked about just prior that the agents can do a walkthrough but it's only for two people at one time that can walk through with the agent and I, now i turn it over to veronica the mortgage operations thank you very much take it away veronica all right, let me unmute myself. Um, so I, I, um, I think we're going to answer questions towards the end. So keep the questions coming. Um, we're excited to hear from you, and we hope to answer the questions that you have that are running through your mind at this time. I'm Veronica Moskowitz. I've been in the mortgage business for over 20 years, and I'm delighted to talk to all of you tonight. And uh, I hope that you uh, get a greater knowledge of what we do on the loan side and that your dream of owning a home come true. So um, thank you, Brad, and we love working with you. So um, I will start my presentation now. Um, so these are the topics of discussion that we will be um, going over tonight. Um, I am going to go over the difference between a pre-qualification letter and a pre-approval letter. We're also going to go over the three characteristics of getting a home loan. Um, and there are three valuable um, things that you need to know. So it's loan to value, it's the debt to income ratio, and it's your FICO score. Uh, in tandem, the loan to value uh, will also surface uh, the need of mortgage insurance. I'm also going to go over some of the products that we have here at LAPFCU and um, the advantage of doing a loan with us. I'm, I'm just reviewing my notes over here, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, so the difference between a pre-qualification is um, this is really quick. We can do this um, within hours. And basically, we are taking the income that you are stating on the loan application, and we're pulling your credit score. And that's with all three credit bureaus. So it's really quick. We send it to you right away, and you can hand it over to your realtor and begin shopping. Some realtors um, prefer a pre-approval, and that's because the seller will ask for it. Um, the pre-approval um, is, is a stronger commitment, and that's because we have had to ask you for all of your income documentation. So we're basically doing a full underwrite. We're asking for your pay stubs, your W-2, your tax returns, your bank statements. We, we are absolutely making sure that you can afford the home that you um, are shopping for. Um, and so when you make an offer and you attach a pre-approval to it, it, um, it's, it stands up to the seller and the real estate agent on the seller side more so than a pre-qualification. The downside to the pre-approval pre is it does take about two to three days um, for us to underwrite it and get back to you. Um, 
And it's a lot of work on your end because you you have to pull all of this documentation for us to, to look at. So I, I just wanted to let you know the difference and, um, and so you have a greater understanding of how that works. Both letters are good for four months. Um, so I would uh, ask that you do it earlier than later so that um, you're ready to uh, make your offer and have that pre-approval letter in front of you. Okay, so we're gonna get into um, mortgage acronyms um, at this point in, in time. We're also gonna talk about the those three risk factors, um, characteristics that I discussed earlier. And I'm sure you've heard the acronym of PMI, it means private mortgage insurance, and also LTV means loan to value. So once you learn these acronyms, they're gonna think that you're in the mortgage business. Um, so mortgage insurance is required um, when you put less than 20% down. And um, and I did a little formula here for you so that um, you can you can uh, look at Zillow from home and you can do these calculations on your own. And um, sometimes when you need us, it's 10 o'clock at night and we're 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 not here. So um, you can play around with numbers and um, and and really see what amount you need to put down to buy your dream home. I'd like to add one more thing. When you do this calculation and you see the amount of money you need, um, that 20% or that 10%, calculate an additional, I'm gonna say about $10,000 um, for closing costs. And that's for points, for all the fees, um, to start up an escrow account. So it's all inclusive. Um, so that will help you understand that it's beyond the down payment money, it's also, it's also the closing costs. Uh, so the loan to value, uh, the, you know what? Let me go backwards a little bit. Um, mortgage insurance, and this is something that's really important. If you don't, if you don't put the 20% down and you need mortgage insurance, we do have to go through uh, underwriting of, uh, for the mortgage insurance. So it's not, it's, it's not something that, you may think you automatically get um, and an, an insurance company is gonna cover you, well, you actually have to qualify for mortgage insurance. And so we have those discussions. Um, you know, we we have that uncomfortable discussion of sometimes you don't qualify um, and, we, and we'll cover that with you that the mortgage insurance company didn't approve you. Um, and it has to do with your debt to income ratio and your FICO scores. So it is something that officially um, requires an approval and and we also will discuss the things like hey do you have 20 percent down because then it avoids that third party approval and we can then make the loan for you and that's actually our goal we want we want you to have that home loan um so the loan to value i again did the little calculation at the bottom it's basically the loan amount divided by the sales price and you can see on this um sample that I put on on this slide uh, is it's at 91%. Um, so at that point, you would need mortgage insurance. Okay, FICO score. So this is um, another risk factor. Um, and it's what your FICO score is. So I'm going to go over a couple of things. Um, I we get a lot of questions about the FICO score. And so I thought I would take this time to go over that with you, help you maybe increase your FICO score by giving you some tips on how to do that and, um, and get that credit score up where uh, you can afford to purchase a home. The minimum that investors are looking for when you're doing a, a home loan is 680. Um, so they're looking for a 680 and above, uh, especially for a first time home buyer. So these are some of the things when my kids turned 18, I set them down because I knew that that they were going to have uh, loan sharks at them, um, you know, trying to get them to sign up for credit cards. And as a parent, that terrifies you because um, you immediately think you're going to have to bail them out. Who what you know, what 18 year old doesn't want to go shopping and, and 
and especially doesn't realize that they have to pay that um, credit card <laughs> back. So, and that it's actually really a loan. So, um, what I what I educated my kids on was that your credit is your lifeline. Um, it'll take you through life and buying cars, homes, um, emergency money. So it's everything. A high FICO score um, is everything. So um, basically you need to pay your bills on time and how i um how i like to um express a ways to do this is to set up minimum payments you know and it could be about 25 dollars maybe the minimum payment on a credit card and this way you can just ensure that every month it's going to be paid in full i mean i'm sorry that the minimum payment is going to be made so that you never get that 30 60 day late and um and then you can always pay off the credit card later, but at least you know and you feel comfortable that uh, your credit card is being paid on time. Um, don't max out the credit cards. Uh, the way that FICO does that FICO score is they look to see what kind of usage um, it, you, you have on your credit card. So they look at the credit limit to the usage amount and that affects your credit score. Um, don't take out new debt, especially while you're doing a home loan. We have had so many times where um, you get a new credit card and you you get excited, and so you're already purchasing furniture and items like that, and then you no longer qualify for the loan. So um, the other recommendation that I have is don't buy a car that is going to have a high monthly payment because sometimes that will disqualify you from being able to afford the mortgage payment. Um, and we've had a couple of those recently where you get so excited to buy a car right out of um, the academy and then your car payment is $800 and you no longer can afford to purchase a home because the payment is so high and we have to use that to calculate your, your debt to income. The other recommendation that I have is to keep your oldest credit card open. The other way that FICO score um, analyzes you is how long you've been a credit user. So it gives them an indicator um, on what kind of credit user you are, how long you've had it, are you responsible? So um, even though you may not like that credit card anymore, keep it open, maybe buy one thing a year on it so that you keep it active, um, but don't close it up because that is the start of your your uh, credit. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the minimum credit score that we like to see for a first time home buyer is a range of 680 to 700. Going to my notes over here, um, hang in there, going to my next slide. OK, so um, I'm sure you've heard the term DTI often. Um, it's a big topic. Uh, it's debt to income ratio. And after the mortgage meltdown in 2008, everything changed. They have all these regulations, these time periods that we have to hold so that you can really think about it and review documents. And we also have to show that um, you have the ability to repay this loan. So, um, so I did a little calculation here for you to let you know how this works. So as an underwriter of a mortgage loan, we have to look at your uh, two year history. So we look backwards two years. We want to see that you've been working for two years, that you have steady income for two years, that there's that responsibility of keeping the job. And then we also have to look three years forward. I know you're thinking, well, we have no idea what tomorrow brings. But as a mortgage lender, we need to uh, do the best that we can to forecast what the next three years is going to look like. So debt to income ratio calculations are really, really important. We like to see anything between 45 to 50 percent um, is the range for debt to income ratio. And that's your income to your monthly debt. And that's where I talked about that minimum payment. Um, not what you pay the 200, you, you triple, you quadruple your payments. It's that minimum amount that's due. Um, so here's how we do the calculation. So um, say that your um, monthly debt is a uh, thousand and that doesn't include utilities. So basically all we can see on our end is the credit report. So anything that you, don't, you had to qualify and that would show on your credit report is what we look at. So we add all your minimum payments that you make a month. Then we take what your 
mortgage payment will be. So in this case, um, it's 3,800, and that includes principal interest, your um, hazard insurance, property taxes. If you buy a condo, we include homeowners um, association dues. Um, and then again, if you didn't put 20% down, then we include the PMI payment. Um, so total all of that, and then add the 3,800 to that, so that we're looking at 4,800 of monthly um, debt that you that you're paying, and then your your income is 10,000, and that's pre-tax. We don't we don't worry about you know what your deductions are or anything like that. So we gross your monthly income, and so there there it goes. The 4,800 divided by 10,000 equals 48% debt to income ratio. So you would qualify. Now that's an interesting um, term that you would qualify. That, that's not the only thing we look at. So you need to have a good FICO score. Um, and so we take all of that into consideration to see if we can give you the loan. Now, one more thing that I wanna bring up about debt to income ratio, it can change. So if the market like COVID brought, you know, a lot of uncertainty, and um, and people were being furloughed, they were being put on loan deferments, um, people had to close their businesses. Uh, so it could be 50% one day, uh, and then we have to reduce it to 48, maybe 45%, because we don't know what's gonna happen. And so so that that's why I provided that range, because it can change based on, on the market conditions. But if you do this little calculation at home, um, it, it gives you an idea what your debt to income ratio is. If you're really good at that calculation, call me. We're always looking to hire processors. <laughs> okay, so now um, I'd like to talk about the products that we have at LAPFCU. Uh, so we do uh, primary residence, we do second homes, we do investment properties. And believe it or not, we do them in all 50 states. So we have a lot of interest in Idaho. People are moving to Nashville, Florida, um, Utah, and more than ever, we've been doing out-of-state loans. So we're, we are very good at it. We do fixed rate. We do adjustable uh, interest rates as well. Um, and then I laid out what the loan balances are for this year the conforming the high balance the jumbo and those are um the amounts and we also do home equity lines of credit here um they're great when um you know like brad mentioned you start gaining equity uh in your home and you want to build a pool you want to do home improvements you want to send your kids to college uh, we go up to 80 percent loan to value on those type of products. What is the advantage of doing a loan with us? Um, I'd like to think that there's a, lots of advantages. You have, um, you have, you're able to do your loan here. It's serviced here. Uh, we are not, um, we don't, we don't sell our loans offshore and you talk to a different person multiple times your loan is being transferred tra transferred um, for the life of the loan it stays here with us um, so that's always really nice you talk to the same people uh, i manage both departments i manage the mortgage origination team as well as the servicing team so if you have any issues um, you call us and and we're able to um, to rectify uh, any of your concerns uh, the other thing is we have our proprietary programs, um, and those are we have loans that you can put 10% down um, with no mortgage insurance. Uh, they are hybrid arms, and hybrid arms mean they're fixed for uh, the, get, the beginning um, for five years, and then after five years, they begin to adjust every year. Um, but how exciting that you only have to put 10% down and you don't have mortgage insurance. That's quite a savings. So we're happy to talk to you about that program if you're interested. We also do a 3% down payment loan, um, and that's not FHA. It's actually a conventional loan. The beauty about that um, is 
uh, you don't have the life of the loan mortgage insurance. So if you were to do that 3% down that FHA has, uh, you have to pay for mortgage insurance the entire term, which is 30 years. Um, you can't cancel it. They changed that, I think, about three years ago. Um, so it can be costly. And who wants to pay mortgage insurance for 30 years? So um, this Fannie Mae program is 3% down. It does have mortgage insurance, but the term of it is seven years um, or when your loan to value is at 80%, whichever comes first. So that's an exciting product that we have. Um, we also have no cost loans, so you can select um, a slight higher interest rate and get a rebate to pay the, towards your closing costs. And you can lock with us at any time after you've applied. We do, um, we do not lock loans that do not have a property address. You have to have a property address. So um, often we're asked for a prequal and to lock, <laughs> and we can't do that. We have to ha actually have a property address to lock in your interest rate. But once you have that purchase contract, um, it turns into a, a full transaction and we can lock it that, that same day. Next slide. Okay, right now we have a campaign going on. Um, so if you submit a uh, purchase application, um, we will credit you back the $650 underwriting fee at, at closing. So that's quite a savings. It's it's a really fun campaign that we have going on at this time. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it back over to Matt. And I truly want to thank you for giving me time to talk to you today. I really hope that you learned something um, and, and that you uh, get closer to purchasing a home sometime soon. And please reach out to me or my team um, for any questions or additional um, training that you would like to to go through. Hey, thank you, Veronica. That was um, a lot of really good information too. Thanks very much for that. No problem. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to touch upon a couple important things briefly, and then we're going to head into our Q&A session. It looks like we may go a little bit over our uh, time limit here. So um, if there are some of you who would just like to stay on with us while we go through the Q&A, um, we'd appreciate that. And of course, if you do have other time commitments, we completely understand. So um, here we're going to um, talk for a minute about our Home Advantage program. This is a, a program that is exclusive to you as an LAPSU member. And the reason I want to bring this up is um, can help you save time and money. Um, so I would um, highly encourage you to go ahead and go to the website address that you see on this slide, lapfcu.mycuhomeadvantage.com. And you can also navigate to that through our LAPFC website, but go ahead and go there, enroll in the program. And when you do, um, you're going to get access to some very important things that could be very helpful to you. Um, you'll be able to use some very powerful property search tools. Um, and also you'll have some powerful research tools that will help you research neighborhoods that you're interested in. You can also set up alerts so that if there's a property that matches your search criteria that comes onto the market, you'll be the first to know. Um, so that is uh, extremely helpful when uh, you're in a competitive market environment. Um, also, um, you're going to get access to a network of real estate agents, and these are agents um, who have been pre-screened by the Home Advantage program folks, and also who specialize in working with our LAPSU members. So these are people who understand the unique needs of the law enforcement family that we serve. And um, as an added bonus, um, when you do work with one of the agents in that network, you're going to get a substantial cash reward for doing that. 
Um, you can go to uh, the Home Advantage website that I mentioned um, to find out how much that reward is going to be. Um, they'll help you with the calculations for that. But um, that is something that is um, extremely helpful in that, um, you know, that could be money that pays for your moving costs or your new furniture. So, um, again, uh, just want to make you aware of this program, and I would encourage you to go ahead and enroll because it's, it's free and uh, it's available to you as a member. Uh, let's go to our next slide on insurance. And just briefly, it, um, it is important that you insure um, your home. Uh, it is probably the most expensive asset that you will have. And so if anything goes wrong, you do want uh, some insurance in place so the insurance company can step in and help you out with that. Uh, you don't want to have to pay out of pocket to rebuild your home if it burns down in a fire. So, um, uh, so you know, um, there are various types of insurance that you're going to want to consider. Fire, flood, uh, Brad mentioned liability, there's theft, earthquake, um, different types of weather damage insurances. Um, and the other reason that you're probably going to have to get insurance, whether you like it or not, is a lot of lenders require that you have insurance for the property because uh, they have a lien on the property and it's also in their interest to make sure that um, their asset is insured. So the good news is that we do offer insurance through the credit union. We have an in-house resource for this. Um, we have Lab CUSO Insurance Services, and Maria Asensio is our uh, insurance coordinator, and she has worked with thousands of LAPFC members, um, and she's very um, familiar with our members and their needs, and she would be happy to discuss all the different types of coverages and your options with you and provide you with a free quote. So, um, our final slide is the contact information slide, and I'm just going to leave this up for a moment or two for you in case you want to take a picture of it, in case you want to scribble some of this down. Um, you heard from Brad. I'm sure Brad would be happy to hear from you if you have any questions or if you'd uh, like to uh, engage Brad and his agency to help um, find you a home. And uh, Veronica, of course, uh, graciously volunteer to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, she also would be happy to help um, answer those questions. Um, her team would be happy to help you get started with uh, a loan application or pre-approval, and you can do that through our website at lepfcu.org. Uh, also wanted to draw your attention to something new that we have, and uh, this is very exciting and convenient. Um, and it's starting to catch on with our members, but you can now also book a virtual appointment with us. Um, so you can actually schedule in advance at a day and time that's convenient for you an appointment with one of our associates. And all you have to do is go to lapfcu.org forward slash bookings and uh, pick an available day and time. And then um, just turn on your camera and your microphone and we'll take it from there. Um, okay, so that is it for the presentation portion, and now we're going to try to get to uh, some of your questions. Um, the first one we had, I believe, is for Veronica, and this had to do with um, FHA versus conventional, and I think you addressed that um, to an extent when you talked about the 3% down program that we have and the difference in uh, PMI. Uh, when it comes to that program versus FHA. Um, but it says, um, basically, um, someone is just asking um, if they can't qualify for conventional, um, do we know the qualifications for FHA or VA? Yeah, yeah. so, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, um, so we don't do FHA um, or VA loans. Um, it's 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 pretty tough on the servicing end of it to um, to do those type of loans. Um, so there's uh, there's people that we can refer you to, 
um, but we don't do it here. We we find that uh, the conventional uh, loan works for many of our, our members, but definitely reach out to me um, if you have gone that route and it didn't work out and you need an FHA or VA loan, I can talk to you uh, or talk with you about it. Thank you for answering that one. And I have another one for you here. Can you get pre-approved in California if you're looking to move out of California? Yeah, that we get that question a lot. Um, and so when you um, want to get a pre-approval for outside of California, um, we have to qualify it. We have to qualify you. Um, okay, so this is, I'm sorry, I got confused if you own something in California and you then want to purchase something out of state. So if this is your first home and you want to purchase something out of state, um, it will have to be as a second home. Uh, because if, especially if you're in the law enforcement um, in the county of LA, we um, we would we couldn't do a primary home out of state because we know you have to be living um, close to your work. So um, yes, we can do that, but it needs to be submitted as a second home. Or if you're planning on renting it, um, and then maybe it's a retirement home, uh, you can do it as an investment property, rent it out and move into it when you're ready to retire. But yes, you can do that. All right, thank you, Veronica. I'm gonna throw this next one over to Brad. The question was about uh, decreases in inventory and whether that was causing prices, uh, home prices to increase. I think it's a combination. Um, I would say, Yes, the interest rates came down, but a lot of the buyers figured out that if they went into the market now, like you know, they've been coming out instead of going, they were playing on example, someone you know was buying last fall, but they really weren't planning on buying till maybe this June or July. They came out to the market sooner because they realized that basically the interest rates at some point in time, maybe after the election, they would start going up. Maybe after they got the COVID vaccinations, the interest rates would start going up. So the buyer, there are a lot more buyers that prematurely got into the market to get that interest rate. Um, and then we had a lot of buyers that were buying, as I said before, trading up um that weren't in, that weren't normally going to move in this market um and then on the other side the seniors we had a bunch of seniors that were not selling you know there's you know seniors that are retired and they're like 75 years old and they're going to retire and move with their family in in um texas or they had a sister and they're going to move with in the boston area because they sit around and they watch the news the news says if you let someone in your house you're going to die so the, the, new, the news is not made to tell you about the Good Samaritan stories. They're made to keep you um, on your seat, watch the news, watch it for longer so they can get the ratings up. Bad news, sensational news sells advertising. Advertising drives the network. So they do more sensationalism um, and they keep you glued to the TV. So a lot of the seniors were afraid to go on the market. So with them now starting to get vaccinated um we think that we'll have more of the seniors come on the market um but there's a big a big surge for a couple of reasons number one you know the historic low interest rates and then buyers needing more space because they're now working at home so that's what's driving the market okay thank you brad um i'm going to give this one to veronica because it's about fico scores um would it be better to start my own credit card um, or as opposed to adding myself on my parents' credit card account if they already have a high score? Uh, this is a multi-part question. Also, uh, what other ways would you suggest I can build my FICO score or credit worthiness um, other than having a credit card? Um, and let's see. Don't have a credit score yet. Like to know the best way about getting one while staying debt free. Yeah, you know, this is a really good question. So um, when you fear um, debt or credit cards, um, your FICO score will not grow um, because they want you 
the credit bureaus want you to have debt so that they can see how you handle it. So this all goes into the formula of, okay, they're credit users because they're not afraid of it. They know um, they're responsible. They know how to pay it um, and they're not out buying things like crazy. Um, and so they're responsible debt users. So unfortunately, you, you will have to um, do a credit card to get that FICO score growing. Um, what I would do is um, if, if you're a, a new, um, maybe you're a new debt user, right? I would max the credit line. And so you can call the you can call the credit card companies and um, and ask for a five hundred dollar credit line and no more than that. So it makes you feel safe and you begin using it, paying it off um, every month or you know just being diligent about it. And that's um, and then you you have to have a good amount of time with that credit card. Um, and when you start feeling comfortable. Um, it, you know, you don't have to have a bunch of credit cards. You don't have to get have four or five to to do that. Just one credit card will begin building your FICO score. Um, but if you're not comfortable with a huge credit line, um, and uh, then that's where I would max the credit line to five hundred, a thousand dollars, and begin using it, paying it, using it, paying it, and you're going to be amazed how your FICO score um, begins to grow. Uh, other ways that you can use it is if you rent and you have utilities, you can report your utilities. Um, the one negative thing about that is um, sometimes you may have roommates and they don't pay the utilities. Um, and so, uh, or, you know, you have a combo of you and your roommate on, on that utility. Be really careful with that. Um, like I told my kids, I said, it, it's your lifeline and you share it. You, you start co-signing for cars and credit cards and all of that, you no longer control your lifeline. And so it's really important to um, be able to own it and manage it and, it and it's all you. Now, your second question you asked about, should I go on my, my parents? And then you immediately get their credit score. It, do, it doesn't work that way. Um, they can get the credit card and add you as a user um, but you won't have the benefit of their FICO score. You just have the benefit of using the credit card. And I kind of like that, especially if they make the payment. <laughs> okay, let's see. We have um, quite a few questions coming in. So um, we probably are going to go over our allotted time just so folks are aware. And also, we may not get to everybody's questions just because there are so many of them, though we will do our best. Um, our next question has to do with um, PMI and is PMI required for the life of the loan or only until you reach 20% uh, of the loan being paid off? So if you do an FHA loan, um, it is now changed where it's the life of the loan. You can't get out of it. It doesn't matter if if you own 80% of the of the home um, in equity. Uh, it's it's the entire life of it. Um, they basically did that because of all the losses that they took during the mortgage meltdown. Um, and so it was their way of rec recouping. Um, for a conventional loan, um, it's about seven years. Uh, if you if prices increase double uh, within four years, you can um, ask your servicer uh, to remove the mortgage mortgage insurance. And what we do is we order an appraisal. And if you have, if you've had it for two years and reached the, uh, 80% mark, then, um, we can request, we can review to remove it. Okay. Um, we have another question here. Can you participate in a first time home buyer program and take advantage of a VA loan at the same time? The first time, um, so um, I'm not sure I understand the question. It's for the same home. Yeah, it almost sounds like um, they're asking if you can participate in two loans at once. And I, yeah, I so believe you. I think I know the answer to that, but I'll let you answer. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a first time home buyer program. So, um, so you can't own any other properties. You can only own one. And um, and I don't I'm not well versed in uh, veteran loans, VA loans. 
So uh, I'm not so sure about the qualifications for that, but I know for the first time home buyer program with Fannie Mae, um, you you have to be uh, a first time first time home buyer to put three percent down. Okay. Um, here's a question about FICO scores. Um, when you're looking at the FICO score, are you looking at the average of a couple? If a couple applies jointly, or are you looking at the separate FICO scores for each yeah, person yeah. individually? Yeah, this comes up um, quite often, so it's a great question. So we pull from all three bureaus. It's Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion for each of our um, borrower. And um, when you're qualifying for a mortgage loan, you have to take the middle score. And unfortunately, we have to take the lower of the two. <laughs> So um, some of some of our members get upset about that. Um, I'm sure it causes some arguments in the home, uh, you know, like, why is your FICO score this? And we had to use yours. Um, but that's the way um, all lenders qualify uh, a borrower. It's the middle score and the lower of the two. OK, uh, here's here's kind of an interesting question. Um, if you if you own a property and then you sell that property, how long do you have to wait before you're once again considered a first time home buyer or are you just never considered a first time home buyer ever? Yeah. yeah. No, actually um so let me look at the guidelines because it's either 2 years or 3 years um before you can be reconsidered a first time home buyer and uh, let me see if I can quickly see that. It's it's one of the two. It's either it's either two or three years and you can be considered a first time home buyer again. So that's nice. Okay. Good to know. Um, I'm going to serve up a softball for Brad here. Uh, I'm in an apartment lease until November 1st. When should I meet with a realtor to look at and close on a home? I would say, you know, in today's today's market, I mean, it might take you a month or two to find something. So I would say if you give yourself a month or two to find something and then a month or two to close escrow, and then if you want to repair that house rather than just move into it, you might want to paint it and clean it. So you could be looking at, you know, you know, depending on how much time you want to fix it up, I would say maybe four or five months ahead of time, start looking. Okay, thank you, Brad. Um, I'm going to toss this one over to you too, Brad. Um, what is the process if you're selling your current house and you want to purchase a new house? What if you can't afford the new house until you sell the current house? Great question. Um, you know, the, the challenge is, and we, we've done it about almost like 65% of the time you go from one house to the next house. Um, we can, you know, do it a couple ways. We can sell your house, sub it to you, find the property of your choice. Um, the hard thing is, is in the competitive market today, it's like I tell clients, you're going into the candy store and you say, I like this little lollipop over here. I want to buy it. Well, when it will get, it's 79 cents. Okay. Well, I don't have my 79 cents. When are you going to have, have it? Well, I don't know because I haven't got my allowance yet. When are you going to get your allowance? I don't know when I'm going to get my allowance. So if you're attempting to go in and, and compete with the other buyer and your property is not even in escrow, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, the next situation is actually when you're in escrow on your house and you're competing with someone else that their house, um, you know, they're just trying to say, here's my money. It's in my hand. I'm buying your house. And you're saying, well, I'm buying your house, but I can't buy it until, you know, April 15th. And in case my buyer buy backs out, I can buy your house. So the best the best way to do it is you know is to once you actually have an offer on your house is to make offers on a new house. We can ask for maybe a 30 day rent back that you can stay after close of escrow. We've done that before, and hoping going to house from house one to house two. Um, worst case scenario, what we've been doing is just having clients go into basically Airbnbs. Um, put most of their stuff in storage and go to Air, Airbnbs for a month or two um, to be able to, to buy the house because once your house is closed, you're no longer a contingent buyer. So that would be the three pro processes of you know try, attempting to do it beforehand, during, during, and then afterwards. 
Great, thank you, Brad. Um, Veronica, uh, here's a question for you. I recently requested a pre-approval, but I didn't qualify. How long do I have to wait to reapply again? Okay, so I just wanted to answer the the last question on the when you're considered a, a, a first time home buyer again, and it is three years. Okay. Um, so um, hopefully, my team did a great job in calling you and discussing what you needed to do to qualify. Um, because I think that's a great information to know what to work towards. So I don't know if you had a FICO issue, um, uh, down payment funds we couldn't um, we couldn't source, um, or it was a debt to income ratio. So um, you can reapply at any time. You can call us at at any time, and and tell us, um, hey, I, I'm there. I achieved what you asked me. Um, to do to qualify for a loan. And so I would like to apply again and see if I qualify. So um, so it all depends on what we asked you to work on so that you could qualify and get approved um, to know to know how to really answer your question. Okay. And then um, I think because we have so many questions to go um, and we're already pretty far over our time, um, this will be the last question, but I want everybody to know that we are capturing all of your questions and we will get back to you with answers on your questions. Um, so the last question of the evening is, um, is it difficult to purchase a house with a partner when you are not married to them? Uh, does pre-approval or pre-qualification work differently in that case? No, it doesn't. Uh, you can um, you can apply uh, for a mortgage loan with your parents, your grandparents, um, your children. Um, yeah, we don't uh, require you to um, be married or live in the same house. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty open. Get uh, bring somebody in with a high FICO score and. Um, <laughs> And a good job, and you're good to go. Yeah. Hey, that's what I did. And then I eventually ended up marrying that person anyway. So, oh, awesome. <laughs> um, okay. So, I'm going to call it just because we are, we are pretty far over at this point. But again, we will um, get back to everybody um, that we didn't get back to as soon as possible. We did um, capture all of your questions. Thank you very much for your questions and your engagement this evening. And a huge thank you to Brad and Veronica. And thank you to all of our members who joined us uh, for this presentation. Really hope you got something out of it and that it's helpful to you. And I uh, hope that we hear from you soon. So everybody have a nice evening and take care, please. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.